for Try It Out Tuesday this week, it becomes important for us to go back to our roots um, and the roots of the Greeks. When we look at coaches, Coach Long's advertisement last week or Try It Out Tuesday last week, he had you drawing on pottery. One such piece of pottery that we look at in our textbook as a primary source here is the story of Zeus and Europa. Uh, a couple things about the pottery. One, uh, there was a shortage of uh, fresh water in Greece due to uh, the mountains and salt water that's so prevalent in this island nation. And essentially, people used pottery to carry um, fresh water from the location and then have it on hand. So these pots obviously are decorative, but also need to be very functional. Notice the handles. Um, and then the story here, as you can see, is a large bull uh, carrying a young woman or a young Greek king um, over the sea here, the dolphins and the fish, um, and then some winged creatures and birds. And essentially, let's look at the poem. Okay, so Zeus kidnaps Europa. Europa, the beautiful daughter of the king of Phoenicia, was gathering flowers when she saw a bull quietly grazing with her father's herds. The bull was actually Zeus, king of all the Greek gods, who had fallen in love with her. When Europa reached up to place flowers on his horns, he suddenly bounded into the air and carried the weeping princess far across the Mediterranean Sea to the island of Crete. Eventually, Europa married the king of Crete and gave her name to the new continent of Europe. Now, some key things that we see in this story are obviously oral traditions, the explanation of where the Greeks came from. Two groups that we know that they clearly come from are Phoenicia and Crete. All right. The other thing that we are explaining is how the continent of Europe got its name. And then finally, um, one of the things that we should pay close, close attention to here is that um, you obviously have the Phoenicians as a parent organization to the Greeks, so they're going to recognize them. Eventually, we're going to see why that matters. If we zoom out here just a little bit, one of the main things that we can see, whoops, too far, is the Greeks adopt an alphabetical system that is similar to that of the Phoenicians. As you can see, the connections here, the A looks similar, uh, the beta looks similar, the delta, again, similar, and so on. Uh, as you can tell, these ideas from Phoenicia, the cuneiform that resulted in the Phoenician alphabet that we talked about, is now rolling into the Greek alphabet and then into the Roman alphabet. So let's get back to page 112 here. 114, excuse me. Um, and we're looking at Zeus and Europa again. So let's go ahead and uh, zoom in on this. Um, from this, what we can also see is that um, there's going to be some things that are going to be similar between the Greeks and the Minoans. Um, essentially, they're going to be traders. They're going to prosper because they're traveling in the Aegean and Mediterranean Sea. Let's go to the next page to kind of get an overview. What we're going to look at in our um, Try It Out Tuesday activity is obviously the geographic pieces of what is happening. On page 119, they provide you with a map. Hopefully I can get it to zoom in there. Maybe I cannot. There we go. Uh, so as you're looking at the map, these are some of the exports that they're going to be trading. They're going to be trading gold. They're going to be trading silver, iron, marble, and timber. And if we're looking at Athens, here is Athens right off of the kind of um, cove here in Greece. Uh, notice that Greece is obviously a peninsula along with several islands. Here's Crete down here like we talked about on Google Earth. And essentially what's going to happen is they're going to use all of these mountains back here, mountains, to defend their city-states from invaders, i.e. the Persians, which are going to come up and around, wanting in on some of the money that they're making based on all of their trades. The other thing that they're going to use is the sea. So they're going to have to have excellent seafaring vessels. Okay? So what we are going to practice on Try It Out Tuesday is we are going to use the Acropolis to defend the Athen Athenians from invading Persians and you guys will try that out and it should be a very very good day now alright so when you're looking at government on your note guide here's the title for that governing the city-states 
Um, and what it basically talks about is as the world expands for the Greeks, they evolve a unique version of the city-state, which they called the polis. Coach Long, I believe, has already talked to you about the polis. And essentially, on the top of the hill stood the Acropolis, or high city, with its great marble temples. We have already looked at the temple of Athena, named sake for Athens. And the Acropolis actually ends up being kind of a military advantage for most of these city-states. Not only did their attackers have to march over large amounts of mountains to get into Greece and into that area, but they had to then climb up the city elevation and then further up the Acropolis to attack the defending soldiers. Some key things to keep in mind about the Acropolis and the Greeks is that they believe in public works, public works uh, become education in Greece. Every citizen has to have two years of education and in that two years they include military training. Now the nice thing about that is these citizens are free residents. They actually um, enjoy a lot of rights and activities and the actual um, areas that are in the city, but they also have a responsibility or a duty. When we talk about government, we talk about the purpose of government is to protect the people. In Greece, they kind of expand that to the people then working to protect the government and the ideologies. The evolution of government in Greece becomes very, very interesting. We actually see, obviously, the king of Crete who um, marries Europa as a monarch. This is where one person rules. Slowly, however, power shifted to a class of noble landowners, landowners being the key idea here. The thing that most likely happened is that um, when we switch to bronze weapons and we're getting these new chariots coming in from the Middle East and um, the Assyrians and the Hittites with the iron axles that we talked about, it's costing more and more money to be able to outfit your army. So the kings, obviously not having a major source of income in their small polis or city-states are now going to reach out to those noble landowners for money. Early, this is taxation um, and is very, very simple for the kings. They go to them, they collect the taxes, and they have the money. When they look at larger and larger amounts of money to outfit their armies and go on conquests and, and conquer other city-states and start to build empires, um, what we're looking at is a need for more and more money. So, Rather than hand over their money, these wealthy landowners are going to actually reach out to the king and say, okay, we will give you some money, but in turn, we want power, we want say over what our government does. And so what we get is a hereditary rule of landholding elite. And we're going to say that there are about three to four of these here that are happening. The next group that we come to um, are uh, oligarchy, and essentially what happens is merchants and farmers and artisans emerge, and because we're in a trading society with a monetary economy, we're going to go ahead and get um, large amounts of wealthy individuals, and when I say large amounts, we mean like five to seven. So we're going to take our aristocracy with three to four people in government, and we're going to expand it to five to ten people in an oligarchy, and in fact, what's going to happen is that um, we're going to have a small wealthy elite, and they're going to use their money to then help push their way into government, and um, so they can inform people so that they can change policies, and in effect, change policies in a way that benefits them. So from there, okay, what we're going to see is we're going to see the emergence of the phalanx, which is a massive tactical formation of heavily armed foot soldiers. It requires long hours of drill to master. It shared training created a strong sense of unity among the citizen soldiers. In their two years of training, they're going to get this. Now, the Spartans become excellent at it and are famed even today for their ability in the phalanx. We're going to talk about the Battle of Thermopylae um, with the Persians. You may have seen the movie 300. Obviously, 300 Spartans hold off a large, large amount of Persians and what they're doing. So, we obviously have talked about education being key to the Greeks. Part of that education is obviously their military training, but the other part of that education is um, logic and philosophy and history. So when we're looking at it, we're creating these three ideas of classical uh, genres of study, 
and here is a picture of the phalanx defending off elephants and barbarians and essentially what you have is you have helmeted soldiers with breastplates they're also going to have um, leg bracers on their legs so that they're covering their shins and they're holding these shields the spear becomes the key part of this uh, and basically what you can see is you can see these guys looking off to their left uh, and they're going to be attacking what looks like to the left. Essentially, the idea of the phalanx is that you're going to defend the man next to you. So this guy is responsible for this guy's life. This man is responsible for this man's life. And this idea then gives rise to every citizen being important. If you've seen the new movie 300, you know that it's key even on a ship. Okay. So what we're looking at is the common good for the polis and the whole demos, demos meaning the people, when a man stands firm in the front ranks without flinching and puts disgraceful flight completely from his mind, making his soul and spirit endure, and with his words encourages the man stationed next to him. Essentially, this picture, combined with the idea of the evolution of government, is what's going to give us what we actually get as democracy in ancient Greece. Let's take a look at one more document that tells us about this, and then we will give you your assignment. Okay, the next document that we want to look at um, for our video today is the document B. Um, it's from a speech titled, The Polity of Athenians, and this comes from your Athens vs. Rome DBQ. Essentially, it's the old oligarch is cited as the author circa 424 BCE. Now, the old oligarch is going to be a person of power and obviously unknown. His quote here is that, I shall say that at Athens it is the poor which mans the fleet and has brought the state her power. What they're talking about here is the Battle of Salamis. The new movie 300 is actually about the Battle of Salamis. And what he says is that the steersmen and the boatswains and the shipmasters and the lookout men and the shipwrights, these have brought the state her power much rather than the best born and the elite. This being so, it seems right that all should have a share in the offices filled by law or lottery or by election and that any citizen who wishes should be allowed to speak for if the poor and the common people and the worst elements are treated well the growth of these classes will exalt and glorify the democracy demos meaning people and crassy meaning government the government of the people now the idea here is that Greece gets its wealth from the phalanx in its defense each man is responsible for each man, so why should they not be important in government? Next, you're also looking at the fact that they're defending themselves in the back with mountains, on the Acropolis with the height of the hills inside their cities, and on the front, the water with the seas. So, in fact, they must have extremely powerful navies to defend their trading empire. So, you have a group of soldiers that are defending each man for each man, and you also have a group of citizens who are sailors, who are poor men, who are chained in as oarsmen, who are building the ships. Um, and what you see, obviously, if you've seen the new movie um, in 300, it's, it's rated R, so not recommended. Um, but what you see is that these big spikes are placed on the front of ships. All right, as you can see, the ship is set up in this way. It has a large kind of protrusion coming out of the front, and this would be actually just right underneath the water. Obviously, all these oarsmen here with platforms to defend them, platform up here and sails, um, and essentially you're going to have your phalanx or your marine-type people up here on the ship, and then you're going to have your oarsmen underneath the ship that would be propelling it in motion, um, and then... As you can see here, what they would do is then drive the ship into the side of another ship, essentially poking a hole in it right down here, and then all of their military men would then board um, the next ship, at which point there would be a battle that would ensue on the water. This is what made the Greeks successful um, when excessively outnumbered in the Battle of Salon. All right, as you can see, um, obviously outnumbered, uh, what you have is the ships in blue that are the Greek ships, and they're defending this kind of small area as the Phoenicians, Ionian Greeks, uh, the Persian fleet are coming in here, essentially trying to cut into Greece and get a foothold on the land so that they can invade. Now, um, one thing that you need to realize is that um, the maneuverability of the Greek ships and their ability to um, take over these larger uh, Persian ships is what helps them in this battle.